This is a production of Cornell University. It's, it's an honor to have you introduce me, Lance. I really, I really do appreciate that. So um, I, will, I will have a disclaimer at the start here. This is kind of a jumble of things I'm going to share with you today, uh, as seems appropriate for, uh, I don't know, an exit seminar. Uh, <laughs> I'm not ready yet, but uh, almost exit seminar. And I'd just like to share with you kind of a really uh, 40,000 foot view of some of the things that uh, my colleagues and I have worked on over these four plus decades. And let's, let's dig in. Great. So uh, one of the things that I want to, you know, help you, uh, especially younger scientists to understand a little bit, if you're interested in the kind of career that I've had, uh, I am a generalist plant pathologist with, uh, with crop responsibility. So what is that like? What is a career like that like? And I, I will jump to say, fantastic. It really is, but go in with your eyes open uh, because it, it really requires you know, time management and finding that balance in life and balance between your, your research and your extension. But, uh, you know, I've, it's been a privilege to learn, learn new things at least weekly, if not daily. Uh, and uh, you, you work with a lot of farmers and, and suppliers and whatnot to, who often set you straight on what you don't know. And actually that's a, that's a wonderful opportunity. Um, you get to diagnose problems. I love problem solving and, and uh, you're not going to find perfect solutions, but you'll find the best at that moment. And the key thing I think is you realize in this kind of a position, you work in a team environment. It's, just, uh, it's, it's not an individual thing. Um, and you get the chance to work with uh, the industry growers and also a chance to mentor students, which uh, as, as Lance mentioned, are the two things I've loved most about my career. Okay, so just briefly, the, this team and some team members have changed over the years, but these are some of the colleagues that uh, I've been in the furrow with, if, if you will, uh, through most of my career. And I see Margaret is here, one of, one of my extension colleagues. Uh, and it's a lot of fun. You had a chance to visit, a, a travel the state, uh, check out some pretty cool little diners, stay in some interesting little towns, and you really have a chance to bond with your colleagues. So my, my position, it surprises some people to know, it's 70% extension. And uh, this is probably something we're not gonna see a lot in the future, but I've really enjoyed it. It's fit my personality and what I've enjoyed doing. But I've also equally enjoyed uh, my research assignment. And it's allowed us to get into all kinds of things uh, over the years. So, and I've had, I, I can't linger on a lot of these slides, but I just want you to know that I've had the privilege at Cornell of having to work with some just exceptional people here. You'll probably recognize a few of those names. These are my uh, technical staff, uh, research uh, extension support specialists over the years. And thank goodness, Kevin Myers is still with me. Uh, and uh, graduate students. Uh, wow, really been privileged in this arena as well. Uh, a number of these students have gone on after their PhD to be members of faculty uh, literally around the world. And uh, also USDA ARS scientists like our fine example in the second row. <laughs> and uh, many of them are, are also adjunct faculty uh, um, in their respective universities. And I've trained people that have gone on to very enjoyable, productive careers in industry as well. Uh, and again, some of that international. Uh, I might just mention for a moment some in the other category when you're thinking in graduate school, you're getting your degree, thinking about what, what do you want to do? You know about industry, you know about academia. Uh, how many people know some of these things? Uh, Lara Litchfield Kimber is now the director of a children's science museum in the Hudson Valley and is just doing great at it. Um, Neil Rowe Miller, uh, he always had an interest in in mission work. Um, he was a Mennonite student and he's spent his whole career in non-governmental organizations fighting hunger in different places in Africa. So that was a launching pad from him. Um, and Dennis Shaw, some of you may know Dennis, um, he operates a consulting business out of uh, near Niagara Falls, New York. 
And he works with university people all over the country to help them analyze their data and put it in shape for publication. So there, there's a lot of different kind of careers one should think about. And likewise, I've had the privilege to have a number of really good uh, postdoctorals, uh, research associates, and uh, visiting scientists. So what is field crops anyhow? You, you probably get a different uh, definition in different institutions, different states around the country. But in, uh, in New York State, uh, we're looking at uh, field corn, which is a big acreage crop, 1.2 million acres of field corn in the state. Uh, hay and pasture land is also well over uh, a million acres. Both of these things strongly in support of the dairy industry in the state. Um, soybean has just, uh, just taken over. Uh, since I started my position, there was about 10,000 acres in the state. We're, we're, we're knocking on a half a million acres the way it's going right now. So uh, soybeans has really come on strong. Uh, small grains uh, have always been important as a rotational crop on our farms. And it happens that a lot of my own research has been in that arena. Um, I've also had the chance in uh, the last uh, decade or so to work on um, grasses that are used as feedstocks for uh, bioethanol and, and bioproducts like bioplastics. And uh, also had a chance to get involved in some of the industrial hemp work that's, that's fairly recent here at Cornell. So my general approach uh, to field crop pathology or health, the flip side there, is to just identify and assess the problems. Uh, try to, you know, the ones that are important enough to really dive into, try to understand the limiting factors in those pathosystems, how they're influenced by the, the host, by the uh, environment, the crop rotation, et cetera. Identify limiting factors and then target your control at those limiting factors. And then obviously make sure you can have something that cures a disease, great, but it, uh, it lowers yield or it does something else detrimental. So it really needs to be delivered in an, in an integrated sense. So anybody that knows me knows that probably my favorite research tool weapon is a disease survey. And uh, almost everybody that makes it through my program is gonna spend time in the field and uh, more than likely do a disease survey. And we've done this on all the crops you've seen on that list before. And I feel that this is just some examples there on alfalfa. Uh, verticillium will really threaten the whole alfalfa industry across the United States uh, when I first uh, came on the job. And that's, that's the thing I did on uh, day one is just try to, to map that, see where it was, look for patterns uh, of that problem. And the wonderful story is our plant breeders like Don Vians, came up in a four or five years with wonderful resistance to that. And we hardly hear boo about Verticillium wilt today. But I like this approach because you get a real world assessment of what's going on on farms, when it's going on. And also uh, I know some people think that the only worthwhile research is uh, hypothesis testing. I would say that discovery research were, is uh, hypothesis generating. So I, I feel that's, an equally important part of science. So uh, amongst, uh, you know, it might sound like we kind of shotgun all over the place and in a sense we do. And a lot of things we've worked on have been for short periods of time, a couple of years, let's say to solve a particular issue. But I've had one common thread in my research from day one till, till the present, still working on. And that is uh, working with uh, Fusarium griminiarum. The Latin is Fusarium of the grasses. And I've uh, been very interested in uh, uh, fusarium problems, uh, of stock rot and, and ear rot on corn and uh, fusarium head blight on small grains and other grasses. Um, so what I'm gonna try to do today, and I know I have more slides and I can probably reasonably get through, but we're gonna race through a few things here. But if anybody wants to talk to me on detail on anything, I'm always glad to do that. And after I talk about some of this mainline of research, I'd like to give you a little vignettes of research in other smaller topics along the way. So that's kind of my game plan here. So I've been fortunate to be part of a, of a national, in fact, international coalition of scientists. What a wonderful group to work with. The uh, USDA IRS uh, has been funding this initiative called the US Wheat and Barley uh, Scab Initiative um, for over 20 years now. 
and uh, been very involved in that organization. This particular um, publication in 2012 was kind of uh, a review of everything we know about that disease and how to control it at that time. And obviously we've learned a lot since. And I've really been privileged to uh, really work so closely with uh, Mark Sorrells and his crew uh, in small grains breeding. And uh, you may not uh, be aware of it, but since I had to leave my lab in plant science building, I am now co-sharing a lab with, uh, with Mark Sorrell's uh, crew. So that's working out very nicely. So I uh, won't get down into too many details, but we've pursued all, all the different ways to control uh, these epidemics in, in uh, small grains. And that includes working with Mark uh, and other breeders to constantly select for resistance. And this is not the sort of a pathogen that you get high levels of resistance, you get partial resistance. But uh, we made some real gains there. And also at the same time, uh, for many, many years, I've been screening uh, uh, fungicides applied at the time that the, uh, the wheat or barley flower. Uh, again, you don't get the big bang. You might get a 50% reduction in the disease and in the toxin. The really, with, the, it, with this disease, yes, it hurts yield, but the real problem is the toxin, deoxynevolanol or DON. And if a farmer is going to sell their grain to a, a flour mill, they will not accept with anything more than two parts per million of that toxin. Doesn't take much in our wet environment to get two parts per million. If you want to sell that uh, to make beer for a malt house, it has to be less than one part per million. So it's uh, really a challenge in the humid part of the world. So, uh, and even when you throw everything at it that you have the tools, if the weather is favorable enough, it's going to overcome it and you're going to get higher levels of the mycotoxins. So just, uh, just briefly here, uh, this is kind of uh, common experiments uh, over, the, over the United States over a number of years, but it shows the principle here. All those bars above zero, with zero being the amount of control of the, the, the levels of the disease itself in yellow and of the toxin um, ingest a completely susceptible variety with no chemical on it. So as you go from left to right, you show the increase in control first with just a moderately susceptible variety. Uh, and then you, with the, with the best fungicide at that time, and then just with the moderate, uh, moderately resistant variety alone, and then all the way throwing everything at it on the, on the uh, right-hand side there. So we're, we're still, we're, we're, we haven't solved that problem, but we're, we're making strides. So one part of the initiative that our group has particularly made contributions to is understanding what role that cultural control uh, would have. And by cultural control here, I primarily mean um, control of residues, particularly of corn in the area, which are the spore producing factories. And these spores are airborne as well as splash dispersed. So, and the, you get two kinds of spores, ascospores, which are, they are, they are uh, airborne and can be dispersed at a distance and, and macroconidia, which are kind of locally dispersed. But um, we've seen a lot of trends and there are people have made kind of jump to conclusions that if you're, you know, first year uh, wheat and you don't follow corn, you shouldn't have any problem. Well, in our survey work, that's just plain not true. We, we see the disease and we see toxin in the grain, even with first, first year corn on, uh, our first year wheat crop on, on plowed ground. Um, yeah, and that's just, call it, so you might think, well, we should have less problem because it's cold here over the, over the winter, right? Well, actually it's like taking your cultures and sticking them in the freezer and throwing them out again. The, the, the organism actually persists longer in our environment than in the South where there's all kinds of microbes working on them. So uh, I have to credit uh, an association with uh, Elson Shields in uh, entomology, who's one of the country's real pioneers in aerobiology. And, uh, you know, uh, Elson and I had discussed this problem for a long time, and he actually designed these uh, remote piloted aircraft uh, with little uh, compartments that over open up that that catch uh, spores on a Petri dish or on a, on a slide plate. And we worked with Elson for a number of years and we established that ascospores in our area and others 
are absolutely commonplace in the, in the planetary boundary layer above crops uh, in our agriculture. So you think about that and you say, well, why would we think it would only be in fields where we didn't have stubble from another the crop? And in fact, that's, that's the line we pursued. And furthermore, we looked at, well, these things are up in the sky. When, when are they getting deposited on the wheat heads or the barley heads? And it could happen anytime, a night or day. And certainly when there's a rainfall event, the, the rainfall, the water droplets wash these spores out of the soil, uh, out of the air, but also natural gravitational settling of these columns of air in the still air at night. Um, we collect far more at night, especially in the wee hours of the morning, uh, than, than we do in the middle of the day. And it all kind of makes sense from survival of the fungus standpoint, it, its likelihood to encounter the moisture it needs. So the next line of uh, inquiry we looked at is, okay, how far, what's the, the dispersal distance locally? We know things can get up like a plume of smoke and move long distances in the air, but what, what about in the field and neighboring fields? And what we did is, is we used uh, genotype clonal isolates that we uh, infected corn with and got infected corn stalks and we cut them up. They had single isolates in them and we put them out in field plots. And then we collected, uh, and, and over the top of that was, was wheat planted over a field and we collected uh, the wheat heads and isolated fungi from them at various distances and also further away, hundreds of yards away in the field. And what we found is that uh, generally, uh, you know, if you compare with what you pick up in the distant background, most of that interference with spores from a source like corn stalks are gonna occur within about six meters. So we decided we're gonna look at this experimentally. That's the kind of distances we'd have to consider. And so this was one of the most fun things I've ever did. I come, uh, one of the farmers I work with called this, uh, says, what, what do you have those rabbit cages out my field for? So what we did is we went in, uh, we, we picked a, uh, a, a field um, of, of, uh, of wheat in the, in the fall of the year. These are winter wheat. And then we went to the closest field of corn stubble, as you can see in this wheat field in the foreground, we went to that field next to it, used our wonderful uh, measuring unit, the, the hula hoop, and collected all the, uh, all the corn stalks within that hula hoop. And then we transported that hula hoop's worth of corn debris over into this new wheat field. And we had these, we had different treatments and whatnot and had them spread out. And then we, we followed the disease that developed in those rabbit cages that had corn stalks, that didn't have any corn stalks, et cetera. And uh, this was done with cooperators. We had 21 different trials uh, spread across different states. And um, it was really kind of fun work. And what we found is that in the vast majority of these, we look at, again, I'm keying in on the mycotoxin, not the disease symptoms, because that's really what we want. If you see the contrast between the red and blue bars, from each of those locations, it's the level of mycotoxin, and it compares uh, the the red is is uh, the wheat heads with with uh, corn stalks right below them, and the blue is without. So you can see that yes, uh, the local inoculum makes some difference, but the regional neighborhood inoculum makes more difference. And uh, so out of all those combinations. Uh, we only saw significantly higher down in three of the situations, well, in, in eight of 41 situations. So you might say, well, that's, that's small plots. That's not, that's not agricultural scale, what's really going on. So I, I, I took that argument and I said, okay, the next thing we're going to do is try to test this on a commercial agricultural scale. And this was also fun. I had some wonderful collaborators you see there. And what we did in each of these cases is we went into, we found in each of our states, we found a, a large cornfield. And with the harvest uh, in that fall, we'll let the, the residue stay on the soil. But then we went in with um, really uh, commercial scale uh, equipment to plow under, moldboard plow, wide strips, 
where the all of the uh, all of the corn stubble or you know large percentage of it is incorporated in the soil, and then other strips that were let unplowed. So we had these replicated strips across fields in these locations, and then we immediately planted in a in a crossways direction. Uh, we we planted the whole field over with winter wheat in the fall, and we followed the crops into the next year, and we harvested. Um, the wheat heads from those plots. And as you can see here, um, every there's dynamics to this thing. Some, some years, some places, there's not conducive conditions for the disease um, and toxin generation. Others there are. So if you can see of these uh, different situations we looked at here, uh, on average, about uh, we saw about a 22% increase in the level of the mycotoxin where corn stalks were under the wheat heads. And so what that really tells us is the majority of inoculum is coming from outside of that. And in cases where we had, you might call more epidemic conditions where the background levels were a half a part per million, then, we, then that was tweaked down a little bit. The absolute level of toxin went up a little bit, but as a percent, it went down. So, uh, and here's another uh, example here, I think, I think I didn't have that slide up on time here, but that's kind of what I just said. So there's not a single answer for this kind of thing, but I think we feel very good for at least within wheat growing areas of the Eastern Central United States, where they're basically in a corn soybean background, a lot of corn in the area releasing spores. We think that less than 30% uh, of this inoculum is coming uh, really from, uh, from the local source of inoculum. As, as compared to the regional neighborhood source in, in the atmosphere. So uh, we've also done a lot of work over the years on the population biology of this fungus. Um, and a lot of this is uh, tied to uh, the mycotoxin uh, chemotypes. And uh, the main mycotoxin is deoxynivalenol, and that's closely related, as it sounds, to nivalenol. And there are two acetylated forms, the 15 acetylated and three acetylated uh, Don. Um, and, you know, most commercial testing is strictly for Don. So for starters, we wanted to see what else was out there. Isolates that are 15 ADON produce Don plus 15 ADON. And the same thing for three ADON genotypes will produce Don and three ADON. Nivalenol, isolates produce only nivalenol. So uh, we did a lot of survey work uh, first in New York and then the East Coast. And uh, we, what we found is that uh, through most of the Corn Belt and, and most of the Northeast even, it's predominantly a 15 ADON population of this fungus. But we did find, we did find some three ADON in the population. And there's sort of a, uh, a cline, if you will, uh, going from south to north. The further north, the more we were seeing the three ADON population. Okay. Yeah. They all produce DON. It's the genotype of three ADON means it produces DON plus three ADON. So uh, we also took a look at this with collaborators uh, across into the Midwest and even into Vermont. And we saw that there's, uh, if you look across the corn belt, there's also a climb from east to west where it looks like going east, you're seeing more of the three ADON types. Um, interesting, there's a climb that's been discussed in Canada for many years where a lot of, of Eastern Canada has a lot of three ADON and a lot of, you know, uh, sort of uh, upper Midwest up into. Manitoba and places west has had a lot more DON than other places. There's an exception. Ontario, the biggest corn producing county uh, uh, province in Canada, has almost exclusively 15 ADON. So there's a feeling that there's a substrate thing going on here too. So following up on this, um, uh, Paulo Cunham from Brazil was in my lab and uh, he started looking at this intensely in New York State on different kinds of uh, environments. And uh, what he, he really 
showed that even further with, with huge uh, sample sizes of isolates. And there's something unique up in the Northeast area where we started looking that has very little commercial production of small grains or corn, um, but uh, it does have some. And also working with our friends in New England and, and Vermont in particular, we found the same thing there. So as you can see, it's almost equal populations of three and 15 ADON. So um, Paulo, uh, he, he teased that apart in an even more interesting way. I mentioned about substrates and stuff. And so we had three locations. One of them is kind of our Aurora is kind of our corn belt like place, okay? Uh, a lot of corn and soybeans grown and wheat. Uh, Willsboro has a Cornell farm up there. And there's very much, there are very little surrounding crops right around there. Uh, you're right up against the Adirondacks. There's wild grasses, there's different things. Down in the uh, kind of Allegheny Plateau, we also had a location in Belmont, New York, and we collected purposely, uh, got isolates from corn debris that had overwintered on the ground, from collection, uh, with spore collection from the air, the atmosphere in those places with spore collections, and from disease wheat heads. And what we found very strongly is this genotype frequency it varies a lot by region, general background, but not by the specific substrate in a specific place. That's fascinating. So uh, a little follow-up on that Northeast New York. At the time we were doing this work, uh, there's, a new, there's a new mycotoxin discovered that we didn't even know about at the time. It's called NX2, another variant off the, the Don pathway. And we said, what the heck, let's have it. We had it tested in Minnesota and nearly half of our three ADON genotypes because of the way that the PCR thing is set up. It, it, there's a first step, PCR would detect it as being an umbrella three ADON, but that also hides the uh, NX2 genotypes. Further, uh, further PCR, different set of primers is used. And we find out that we also have this NX2 genotype in fact, it's the highest population of NX2 genotype found anywhere in the world. Now, go figure. Uh, uh, you know, maybe they haven't looked enough in some other places, but it is, it is quite interesting that we have that variation in our own backyard. So it makes New York State just a wonderful living laboratory to look at some of these questions. So a uh, few things, uh, summaries from Michael Fulcher's uh, popular, uh, uh, dissertation. Um, and he describes these, well, it's been described before, these three or two at least ancestral populations, the 15A Don, the 3A Don, and now we layer onto that the NX2. And they, they overlap, but yet they, they, they have distinct signatures that, uh, of population that, uh, that he looked at in his thesis work. And um, still roughly, and I said, the nice thing about working on this in New York is we're kind of where the East, West and North, South Klein sort of come together here. So it's, uh, it, it's kind of fascinating. And uh, again, we've kind of talked about that. One of the additional things that, uh, so you start thinking of all the possibilities, what, what's really affecting population structure uh, here and why, why is there that division? And uh, we looked at things like temperature. There's a lot of things I'm not gonna show you because I don't have time. But one of the things we thought is the overall background. So if you're in a sea of corn with little fields of small grain, you got, you got corn uh, spores coming out of corn all over the place, right? So that's probably gonna have a major effect in the Midwest and even Western central New York. But when you get into some more marginal uh, agricultural areas where there's not a lot of cultivated grains, um, we wondered about, well, maybe it's the grasses that are driving uh, the population structure there, not necessarily uh, uh, just the cultivated cereals. So uh, uh, Michael did many interesting things, but one of the things he, he, he did is to look at what the populations look like at an interface between weedy grasses or natural grasses and cultivation. And one of the, one of the laboratories he used with the Montezuma Natural Wildlife Refuge at the north end of the lake, was his, which is essentially a huge grassland. So he, uh, he studied, uh, he, he collected uh, isolates there and also in a fairly small radius from commercial uh, farms around that. 
So I'm going to just share a tiny bit of that. Um, one of the things he found, and he got those isolates, and he wanted to see if they differed in virulence on different hosts. And what, I, what you can see in this slide, uh, the second set of bars in both graphs from, from your left, uh, that indicates wheat. And that shows the production of uh, residue of wheat to produce ascospores compared to all those other grasses. And most of the natural occurring grasses are as good of source of spores as, as is the cultivated cereal. So that's, that's quite interesting. And I have to throw in there that it doesn't cause the usual visual symptoms on the, uh, on, on the, on the small, uh, gra on the grasses. It's, it's very often symptomless, but when they die, it grows out and they sporulate. So that's another interesting feature. Um, and we, we got a hint that if you look at large enough populations over a big enough di distance, you, you might see some trends shaping population. And one thing we saw, you know, not real strong, but we saw some evidence that the isolates coming for grasses weren't quite as virulent on the wheat is as what was coming from wheat or corn. But again, that's kind of a trend, not a conclusion. All right, so in the rest of the time, I would like to talk about my lab group through the years and uh, some of the folks in it and give just very brief vignettes of some of the other research we, we've been able to work on. So this is my first crop of students, if, if you will. And I don't know if you know some of those folks in there. Uh, some of you know may know Nancy Keller, uh, Dave Kalb. I think a lot of you around here know Dave when he was my uh, research support specialist there. But it's a great group for me to start with. And the first vignette I'll share is that we had some concentrated effort on corn anthracnose stalk rot, which was really coming on and causing uh, crop loss about the time I started my position. And again, I'm not going to read everything uh, to you here, but uh, particularly the, the, the uh, work of Nancy Keller and uh, Moimbo Concolongo in particular, um, they were able to do some really neat work on crop loss assessment and whatnot and showed that injury wounding by the European corn borer created an infection court for the fungus that really increased the amount of disease and, and the amount of crop loss. Um, we worked with Vernon Grayson at the time, Margaret's predecessor, and, and one of his students from Africa and were able to identify major genes, separate genes, uh, for resistance to the leaf blight phase and to the stock rot phase. Those are still in use in the industry today. Um, we also uh, were able to uh, identify BT corn, which was just starting to come on then, the transgenic corn with against uh, earworm, or well, different, different insects, but in this case, corn borer. And it was working very well in diminishing the damage that we were seeing from, uh, from this fungal stock rot. Um, in particular, Muimba uh, did some really nice work uh, looking at when we wounded a corn stalk, either with a, uh, an insect or with an ice pick or some kind of artificial wound, and introduced inoculum at different periods of time. He also found that there's a very rapid wound healing phenomenon that goes on in corn. So in addition, uh, what's, what's kind of interesting there is a, as an insect that's not just wounding and and stop wounding, it's continually wounding. And I don't show it here, but we also had evidence that the uh, fungus passes through the gut of the insect and it can actually be an, an, a vector uh, for, the, uh, for the pathogen. Um, Anamik Skilder uh, was a, a, both a master's and PhD student with me. And she did some just beautiful work on uh, tan spot disease of wheat, really a thorough study of the seed infection process, and also of, of the, uh, she did some beautiful histological work on the seed to seedling transmission of this fungus. And um, anyhow, it's, it's some very elegant work. If anybody's interested, I can talk to you further. Moving into the 90s, and uh, here we first meet our friend uh, Lance and, uh, and some other New folks, you see Dennis Shaw there, um, a number of people uh, that I think you, you will recognize, Rebecca Bennett there on the bottom. Um, some vignettes from that period of time. Applause. Uh, 
Lance uh, Hanel Davidson's work was, was preceded by work by Neil Rowe Miller and Julia Carroll, all did thesis problems on soil borne wheat viruses. I don't have time to talk about the other soil borne virus, but uh, wheat spindle streak, bimal virus uh, through survey work and whatnot is the most prevalent uh, virus on small grains, or, or on wheat, I should say, in New York. Um, Neil did some really interesting work where you, you went in and, and uh, fumigated whole plots that had a history of uh, the disease, soil borne disease, and he saved soil, re inoculated by hand over individual rows. Uh, and we also had a field that had a natural gradient of disease, and we paired up small plots of resistant variety over that gradient. And we were able to make some estimates that uh, about 30% reduction in yield for a disease that almost no farmer recognized or know they had. When the, it, it occurs in the early spring after the crop, when it's still cool out, and once it gets to you know 75 degrees outside, you don't see it anymore. But even with what it was doing to the early development of the plant, we can get that kind of yield impact. So that was very interesting. Uh, Lance, one of the things that I wish I had time, or someday maybe I will, uh, the, the dogma is that this virus is transmitted by uh, a polymyxograminous, a, a soil-borne protozoan. We have no proof for that, and nobody else has any proof for that. I, I think even till now, Lance, but you found evidence that it was replicating in another protozoan called Colpota, but we never quite got to prove that it actually transmitted to wheat. And uh, for about a year, Michelle Heck also worked in our lab working on this. So that's one piece of unfinished business I wish we could do someday. Okay. And moving into the double knots, <laughs> some other new characters on the scene here and uh, some wonderful people. And particularly I wanna outline here the work of Dennis Shaw who really, really described the seed borne nature of Stagonospora nodorum blotch on wheat, which is our most prevalent foliar disease on wheat in New York State. And uh, again, I can't go through everything there, but we found it was present in most of our seed. Uh, both he and then Rebecca Bennett after him uh, did some really nice work to show how the same genetic diversity uh, that uh, people have characterized in fields of foliage is also all that diversity is right there in a bag of seed when you plant it in the ground. And uh, pair that up with the fact that we did spore trapping, examining debris for years and could never find an ascospore um, or a pseudothesium there. So the dogma was it's airborne, it's coming from wherever an ascospores. It may at some point, but in our circumstances, we could never validate that. And uh, through some pretty elegant work with, uh, with uh, uh, genotyped isolates released and recapture in the field, we were able to sh at least show that uh, it, it's potentially a lot of the initial inoculum in this disease could be coming from seed. All right. Uh, one of my, well, uh, Emerson Del Ponte uh, spent a year with me from Brazil. And here's another dogma thing. The dogma is that Fusarium head blight is a single cycle disease and infection only occurs exactly at flowering and occurs through the anthers. Okay, it's not that simple. Um, I, I won't say much about these graphs up here, but we took a very susceptible variety and we did inoculations through every stage of, of from flowering uh, through the, the maturity of the seed. And we look particularly at the, at the buildup of the mycotoxin in that seed. And what we in fact uh, found was that you can get infection all the way up to the dose stages of development. What, what is key is if you're gonna have a major impact on yield, those uh, uh, inoculations at flowering through kind of the early grain development, kernel blister, that's when you get the big blast of toxin and you get major impact on yield. But a lot of us have observed, we have a year out in the field, we see no visual disease and the farmer gets the, he, uh, pulls the grain to the elevator, we won't buy it, it's full of toxin, what's going on? 
because inoculation at later stages, natural inoculation, can still result very easily in more than two parts per million in that seed. So we kind of expanded that window of understanding a bit. Um, brown root rot of alfalfa was a, a, a problem that uh, we didn't understand much about at all. It's, a, it's, a, uh, it's actually a snow mold fungus. It's the most curious thing. You can see those uh, amazing uh, pycnidia there with like the, the little antennae on them there. It, it's something to look at, but it's, uh, um, this was the PhD thesis work of Michael Wunsch. And uh, I don't know of a student that's done more work for their PhD thesis than Michael did. I mean, he was just amazing. But uh, he surveyed literally all over North America. <laughs> he, he went to a lot of these places uh, looking in the soil. Uh, to make a long story short, we got this tremendous isolate collection. We, we, we looked at virulence. We looked at uh, uh, physical, cultural characteristics, what, anything you could dream of. And, and he also looked at nine different genes to do a multi-gene sequencing on it. And we came up with uh, uh, seven distinct clades that we could have very easily called new species. But since we didn't know that the biology was fundamentally any different with any of these, we, we, we took the conservative approach and we called them varieties. So one of the things he did uh, near the end of his time here is he developed a, a two-step PCR protocol with Indel primers and whatnot that uh, with those two steps, we could get, uh, first of all, in the first step, we can identify Fomus chlorotioides at a species level. Then with, uh, with this combination of these two steps, we can get it down to one of those seven um, uh, varieties. And uh, the, the small, the, excuse me, the forage breeding program here is continuing some work that we started with them, trying to select varieties, populations in Northern New York that are both, uh, yeah, I can see I'm going over here, but uh, um, to try to get some resistant varieties. So I'll tell you what, I'm gonna fly through a couple of things you're interested in these subjects, come, come join me for a cup of coffee sometime and we'll talk about it. But we've, we've worked on some really interesting work on, on uh, new disease switchgrass head smut. Um, we found the first Fusarium graminiarum uh, isolate in the Americas that has high resistance to, uh, to one of the triazole fungicides, tebiconazole. Uh, let's see. Um, this would be mostly about Julia Crane's work on biological control of fusarium. We've done some really fun work with colleagues at Michigan State and University of Texas on uh, switchgrass leaf rust. And uh, uh, what's occupied a lot of our time recently is working on malting barley, uh, particularly the, uh, the thesis work of Andrea Lugo Torres and Alyssa Blachez. So anybody really interested in that topic, you can join us at the Culinary Institute of America in December. And we're gonna have a summit, a state summit on that. And with a lot of uh, tasting of beers and spirits made from New York grain. So if you need an enticement there, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna end it right there. And uh, I hope we had time for a question or two. Okay. So, anybody in the room? Rebecca. Thank you, Jay, for that wonderful tour, of course. And really, such a wonderful asset to you know, anybody else in the Bates Pathology Arena. All these years, it's been great having you down the hall. Um, I was wondering if you could count on, um, comment on how you see the public health implications of those different trichomyces that you described. Like, some yeah. of them are, you know, as you mentioned, you know, newish or, or not even tested for or That's whatever. Right. And on your thirty percent from from no tiller from leaving the local yeah. residues, like is that important? And sometimes bumping a sample over the legal limit, or just plain important because thirty percent of Don is not as important. okay. So Rebecca basically has a two prong question. The first of it is about safety with these mycotoxins and these commodities. Um, I do have some concerns, uh, particularly. Uh, you know, we haven't saw, seen ridiculously high levels of the acetylated dons, but on occasion we do. Um, and we're uh, so in the commercial trade and in industry in grains, nobody is routinely when you bring a tractor load into a mill, 
Nobody's looking for anything but Don. They're mostly ELISA tests for Don, okay? And that's kind of everything's focused on that. I think, they, I think in, in the future, they may need to look at total, what we call beta trichothekines. Um, but our microbiological work is also revealing that we have other fusarium fungi that can produce some of these beta, uh, alpha trichothekines like uh, HT toxin and, and T2 toxin. So nobody, essentially nobody's looking for those things today, okay, other than researchers. Um, so I think that's something to be addressed. I mean, I'm not yelling fire here because I don't think we're finding a lot, but the potential is there. Um, yeah, and your second question was about uh, the inoculum coming from different places, from the atmosphere, from debris, yeah, whatnot. And, and, and yeah, sometimes people hear me talk about this and they think, well, he's saying it's not important, don't worry about it. No, if you, can, if you have some health thing and you could decrease your problem by 30%, you're gonna do it, right? So it's one of the tools. The, the real message is you need every tool in the tool chest. You need cultural practices, yes you do, but don't count on it solving everything. You, knew, you need fungicide. Uh, I've worked for quite a while with the organic grain community. And I'm sorry to say, I find nothing in the uh, organic OMRI uh, sort of uh, quiver there that's going to uh, uh, really solve that right now. But we have a critical need there too. And then breeding. Yeah, other question? Alan. Gary, if you look at a crystal ball at the projected climate change and other field crop growing areas in the U.S. and across the world. I mean, what, what changes do you see coming to New York State? Uh, because we seem to be in a, in a sense a bit of a sweet spot, I think. Yeah, uh, you know, I think some, well, for instance, even fusarium has been uh, postulated that it's increasing because of our, our warming trend. But we're going to see changes, Alan. I just don't know pre pre precisely what they'll be. It, just as some things will be more prevalent, some others may drop off that list. I think it's just going to be different. Um, but certainly the, uh, the trend of having these major uh, rainfall events, that, that's a concern. Um, and, and like we, we saw almost no foliar diseases the early part of the season. Well, once it started raining in August, that all changed. Now, almost any cornfield I go in is, is just up to the gills with Northern corn leaf blight, Northern corn leaf spot right now. So, yeah, it's just hard to say what those changes are going to be. Yeah. I, and I saw there's an extension meeting advertised in November. I got a kick out of it. I kind of knew what they were doing that about growing rice in New York. And people are growing small plots of, uh, of rice in the Hudson Valley and in New England. So who thought we'd be talking about that, right? Gillian. Um, we know. Various forms are of dawn are bad for us yeah. as people, right. as humans. How many of them are clearly plant virulence determinants? I think the only strong evidence is for Don itself at this point, but I, I don't know. I haven't kept up with their, some of the people in Peoria and other places are doing there, but I've only seen evidence that Don, but you know, they're. They're closely related molecules, so it's it's hard to believe that they wouldn't have some impact as well. Um, yeah, w one point I'd like to make for people that are you know get scared by oh all this done and everything, uh, it's basically the farmers that are taking the losses on this because the, it's not by and large getting through into our food products, but that means that the farmers can take a, a tremendous hit in some years and the public not even be aware of it. So be nice to your farmers. I just have a question. Because sure. You talk about the 30% that of yeah. the area that's local. Yeah. Right? And so speculation about the other 70% seems like there might be two hypotheses, like something similar to the Puccinia pathway, bringing yeah. up yeah. Uh, spores, you know, especially since you're finding yeah. uh, spores in, in yeah. low atmosphere or whatever you call it. Yeah. Um, or the grasses that are. Reaching yeah. Out, like, so the only thing. The only thing I could say with absolute confidence is that viable spores can come into a, a field from kilometer distance. And I say that because we found viable spores 
in these pontoon planes, we flew over lakes and stuff that were more than a mile across. And, and so I could say that, is it 10 miles? Is it a hundred miles? I can't say, we, we haven't figured out how to attach those little radio transmitters on the spores and, and follow them along like they, they do at the ornithology lab there. But uh, it does become speculation uh, there. But the other thing is interesting, yes, spores get exchanged around regions, but there is regional structure to these populations. And you know what drives that? There, there's probably always some admixture there, but you know what, what drives regional selection of different scales? We don't know. Yeah. F further PhD pro problems. Well, in the interest of time, thank you. Questions, everybody. Let's give Gary a round of applause. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.